Welcome back to Idea Me, the platform that moves the human story forward. You're here with Andrea McDonald, the founder of Idea Me, and I'm the lucky one to be with Rob Balot. I'm an attorney with the law firm of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister in Cincinnati, Ohio. Also, an author of the book Exposure and um, proud. Uh, father of three boys and um, happily married. This interview talks to uh, professionals in the field, to scientists, to lawyers, but very critically, we try to involve everyone in the ideas that move the human story forward, to entertain them and to inform them. Can you take us through the legal process through which you went after one of the biggest chemical companies in the world. Yeah, um, you know, this was a process that actually stretched out. Um, now we're heading into, I think, year 22. Uh, so it's been a long process. Uh, it started in uh, 1998 uh, when I was approached by a, a farmer out in West Virginia trying to get some help trying to, to understand why his cows were dying on his farm outside of Parkersburg. Um, that, that legal case um, for one family in West Virginia then morphed into a large class action lawsuit for his entire community, some 70,000 people along the Ohio River um, in, a couple years later. And that then morphed into a series of thousands of personal injury cases and trials, and now currently working on cases representing uh, different entities all over the country, um, injured parties, uh, including individual states, water providers, and now also trying to bring a, a class action on behalf of everyone in the United States that has uh, certain class of chemicals in their blood to get adequate um, studies and testing done. Could you talk to us about the particular chemical, the four different names for the same chemical, and also how you came into contact with a farmer that launched this global campaign and legal mission? Sure. The, uh, the chemical that's really been at the heart of this litigation over the last several decades is a chemical called PFOA, which stands for it's sort of a mouthful, perfluorooctanoic acid, uh, which was also called C8 because it's a chemical that has eight carbons attached to a fluorine also called FC143 and also called APFO. It was just a lot of different names for the same chemical. It's a chemical, a completely man-made chemical, uh, came out right, right after World War II, um, that is part of a larger family of man-made chemicals that we now may hear referred to as PFAS, P-F-A-S, per and polyfluoroalkylated substances, another huge mouthful. Uh, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, of chemicals in that class. PFOA is the one that um, really was the heart of our litigation for many years. And that started with um, um, my meeting the farmer you mentioned, Wilbur Tennant in West Virginia. Um, he reached out to me one day. Uh, I got a telephone call in my office back in 1998. And this gentleman on the other end of the line started uh, rattling on about cows dying on his property. And not the kind of case that I typically handled at my law firm where we did a lot of um, corporate defense work for big companies. But then he blurted out that he'd gotten my name from my grandmother um, who uh, lived in the area. My entire mother's family grew up outside Parkersburg. So when he mentioned that connection, uh, yeah, that he had gotten my name from a referral through my grandmother. That changed everything. And I, I, I listened and invited him up to, to come show me what he had. Um, I was hoping that we might be able to help him. After all, this was somebody from what I considered really my hometown. Can you take us through what he had, how this chemical seeped into his land, and also what he did in order to build a case, I guess, build up evidence with in mind that hopefully one day he would come across somebody like you to defend him? 
Yeah, you know, at the time, when he first reached out to me, when he placed that phone call in 1998, he really had no idea uh, what chemical or what what material was causing the problems. Um, it wouldn't be uh, for another year or two before we even uh, discovered this chemical PFOA being in the water that his cows were drinking. So when he first reached out to me, really what he was seeing was his cows were, were drinking from a creek uh, that ran through his property. And the creek, at, the, at one end of the creek was a large landfill where white foaming material was being discharged. So he could see his cows drinking this white foaming water. They were, they were getting sick, they were getting tumors, blackened teeth, dropping dead, deer, wildlife in the area, birds, fish, also were getting sick. Um, so he, he had no idea what was causing the problem, but he was pretty sure it was something in that water. So when he came up to meet with me, he brought videotapes. He, he couldn't really get anybody locally to, to listen to him, to talk to him. Uh, the owner of the landfill was a huge employer in town. Nobody really wanted to get involved. So he had gone out himself with his own camcorder. These were the days of the handheld camcorders. And he went out and started videotaping what he was seeing beginning around 1995. So by the time he met me, he had dozens of videotapes going back with hours and hours of footage, including him uh, having himself getting in and dissecting these animals to, to, to see what was going on in the organs inside uh, and photographs. So he had done his best to try to document what he was seeing on his own in, ho in hopes that somebody someday would finally pay attention and listen. This wasn't just one case that you worked on. Um, there was a there are still a collection of cases going on and uh, you're still working on this issue. Can you right. take us through the turning points? I've just read your book and it seems to me that there were certain absolutely critical turning points. For example, an attempted uh, gagging order on you from speaking at a, a public talk on this subject. Could you take us through the critical turning points? Sure. You know, after we initially took on Mr. Tennant's case, and that was a that was a big decision for our law firm to go after a big chemical company in town one of the largest chemical companies in the world, the DuPont Company, uh, that owned the landfill. But after we had figured out what was going on with Mr. Tennant and his property um, and were able to resolve that case for him, um, we had really uh, at that point uncovered the fact that this was a chemical contamination that was impacting far beyond just Mr. Tennant and his property the farm in West Virginia, this was something that was in the drinking water of the entire surrounding community and likely had been there for decades. So I had to make the decision and our firm had to decide, how do we, how do we address this massive public health threat? So I had eventually decided to put a, a letter together. Um, this was in uh, March of 2001. Uh, to disclose this information to the federal and state public health agencies in the area um, to try to get them to do something about this. Um, so I, I took that step um, and as you indicated, the company fought back by trying to go get a gag order to prevent me from disclosing this information to the public, from discussing it with the environmental protection agencies. Luckily, the, the court denied that order and we were allowed to proceed. Then after that, another pivotal point was um, when the community found out that this chemical was in their drinking water, they came to us and asked us, you know, how can we get rid of this? How can we get it out of our water and find out what it's doing to us? And at that point, we made the decision to bring a class action against this huge chemical company, DuPont. Uh, that was in 2001. So that was a real pivotal turning point. We could have stopped after we had taken on the case of Mr. Tenet and resolved it, but we decided this was a public threat, something we needed to address. And frankly, we might have been the only people that had seen this information within the company's internal documents. So we really felt we had an obligation to do that. And then that case finally settled in 2004. And once again, we could have decided to simply um, uh, distribute the money through the settlement and walk away. But we decided to do something kind of unique. We 
decided to use the settlement funds to set up a massive human health study, uh, one of the largest ever done, um, which then stretched the next seven years, uh, where we weren't sure what the outcome would be. We were, we were pretty confident it would confirm the various health effects we were seeing in DuPont's documents, but nobody had ever done this before. So we took that step in 2005, we set up this massive health study. Um, and in 2012, the results of that study came out confirming the chemical in the water caused various diseases, including cancer. And then once again, we could have stopped. Uh, but at that point, we had thousands of people who had these diseases, including cancers. So we agreed in 2013 to, to lead a new phase of litigation to to try to get compensation for those people. That involved some 3,500 individual cases. We started taking those to trial. And then in 2017, we um, were able to settle those for some 670 million. And again, we could have stopped at that point, but uh, we made the decision to then try to help others who've been impacted by these chemicals all over the country, all over the world, um, including launching this new case I mentioned, which is seeking to bring a case on behalf of everyone in the country now who has a, not only PFOA, but the related PFOS chemicals in their blood to try to get the science confirmed about what these chemicals are doing to us. So there were a number of pivotal turning points throughout this process. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm proud to be able to say that we, I think, made the right decision to, in each time, to, to keep pushing forward and to try to keep making sure we could do what we, what we could to, to address this, what has become massive public health threat. It is extraordinary to me, um, hearing of the 1962 study on rats, and then later the study in 1978 on monkeys, and then all evidence uh, which proves that uh, DuPont was very, very much aware of the Ne negative health impact of this chemical. Do you have, and, and then that coupled with the fact that uh, I see Teflon is still operating. I went on their site uh, today and they have recipes and all sorts of things appealing to the consumer. I went on to the DuPont site and they speak of being um, very pro sustainability in the community. It is so difficult to get one's head around that. And then, you know, they have paid up nearly $700 million and the fight continues, yet they're still operating. Do you have any plans to collaborate or are you collaborating with other lawyers globally to, to go after DuPont and Teflon? Yeah, and we have uh, we've begun working with different uh, lawyers across the United States, um, uh, different different folks that are trying to, dealing with the same problem, trying to address the the ever expanding impacts from from this class of chemicals. You know, these chemicals. It's not you, you may hear them referred to as emerging contaminants. Um, the, the only thing emerging is the public's awareness that these chemicals are out there. Yeah. I mean, they've been out there for decades, and unfortunately, now people are just now realizing the extent of the contamination in the water, in our blood, um, in in the environment. Um, but we are we're we're trying the best we can to work with as many different groups as we can, not just lawyers in the United States, but also lawyers um, in other countries, and community groups in other countries, and advocate advocates and researchers, scientists regulators, anybody that's, that's trying to learn about these chemicals, where they are, um, where, what products they've been used in, what, is, what, what do we know about the science? And there's a lot we know about the science. Um, and what do, we, what, what do we need to do to, to protect ourselves? So um, it's, it's an ongoing effort and it's expanding globally at this point. Could you talk briefly about how you discovered it was this chemical and the honor system for new chemicals? Sure. Uh, you know, it, we were handling the case for Mr. Tennant and his family, the original case that we were working on back in 1998, 1999, um, digging through documents. And at that point, you know, the company DuPont 
that owned the landfill was only giving us documents relating to regulated hazardous listed toxic materials in the landfill. And we weren't finding much, frankly. And so I had gone to court and asked that the court order DuPont to turn over documents relating to all of the material it was sending to that landfill and, and ma making at its plant down the river, um, not just those that were listed or regulated. And when we started pouring through the hundreds of thousands of pages of documents we finally got from the company about all of the materials, I stumbled across a letter one day that mentioned this chemical, um, APFO or PFOA. I'd never heard of it. I couldn't find anything at the time, even telling me what it was. But there were a lot of internal DuPont documents talking about it. And what we found out was, you know, this was a chemical that had been invented right after World War II and by the 3M company. And 3M had been selling it to DuPont since as early as 1951. And DuPont was using it to make Teflon. So they were, they were using lots and lots of this material for many decades. And a lot of it was being emitted out into the environment with no restrictions whatsoever. And you may wonder, like you say, how, how can that happen? Uh, aren't they regulated? Aren't they restricted? In the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency, the federal agency, didn't even come into existence until 1970. And some of the first federal laws in the United States regulating new chemicals coming out on the market came out in 1976. This is decades after this chemical came on the market and DuPont had already been using it. And in the US, when those laws came out, they really focused on new chemicals coming out into the environment. So what about these existing chemicals like PFOA? Well, the law essentially said that it was up to the companies that were making and using those chemicals to alert the US Environmental Protection Agency if they found any evidence indicating the chemical might present a substantial risk of harm to human health or the environment. And even though we were seeing all kinds of internal studies suggesting just that, that these chemicals were harmful and were presenting a threat, unfortunately, the company was making the decision that it did not need to disclose any of that to the EPA. So what happened is this went essentially un uh, unnoticed by the, by the agencies for decades. And when we finally revealed it to the US EPA, in 2001 and started sending them these documents. They ended up suing DuPont in 2004, claiming um, that, hey, this is information that you should have sent to us. And if you had sent it to us a long time ago, we might have begun being able to regulate these chemicals decades ago. So it was a real flaw in the system here, in the way in which chemicals were identified and regulated. And it, and it led, eventually, this was used as an example of some of the problems with our system and led to some uh, revisions and beefing up of the U.S. chemical laws in 2016. How do U.S. chemical laws com compare with the chemical laws of the rest of the world? Are there any main comparisons that you like to make? I'd say a, a critical uh, distinction is in the U.S. and in our U.S. legal system, if you've been exposed to a toxic chemical in your water, for example, under our, under our system, the person who's been exposed is told that they have the burden to prove and to bring in the science to prove that that chemical is actually causing them harm. The company that's emitted the chemical or put it into their water or put it into their blood is told they don't have a burden to prove anything. So it's, it's very difficult for those who are exposed uh, to come in and marshal that kind of scientific evidence to prove that these chemicals are causing harm when that often requires massive epidemiology human health studies involving tens of thousands of people. So it's incredibly difficult. It's, it's almost impossible uh, for the people who are exposed to, to meet that kind of burden. Whereas other, other systems, for example, in Europe, are, are based more on what we'd call a precautionary principle, where you, you take action to protect people from the exposure before you have you know, ironclad 100% uh, proof that this chemical is killing them or making them sick. But in the U.S., unfortunately, 
uh, the, the system is sort of reversed and the exposed people have the burden to do that. And, you know, the, the situation we have with PFOA where we set up this independent panel that did the science, that did finally confirm the health effects, it's one of the only times the exposed people have been able to meet that legal burden. A lot of this is about legal strategy and outmaneuvering a massive organization that has huge resources and some of the best legal minds. Can you talk to us a little bit about the judges? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things I try to to try to explore and give give folks a little more detail on in the book, you know, in my book Exposure is just that, you know, the 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 legal maneuvering and the strategies and the the it's almost like the chess game, you know, yes. one move <laughs> forward, another move backward. Um, and we 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 were fortunate to have a series of really fantastic um, judges and um, lawyers involved, um, beginning with our judge in our first case with Mr. Tennant um, in West Virginia, a federal court judge in West Virginia, uh, and then a judge in the, our our class action case in West Virginia, who who was able to to see through a lot of arguments and get right to the meat of things and make sure that you know, um, we got we were able to get to the truth. Um, and extending through um, a series of uh, additional judges through our personal injury cases um, in Ohio for our thousands of people who, again, were, were able to make sure the truth came out uh, and that, that documents weren't kept secret and that, that people were allowed to have their day in court and allowed to finally make this information available to the public. Um, you know, that's... It's one one thing that's that's definitely um, you know just tremendous about the U.S. legal system is the ability for folks you know when they don't have recourse when the when the government isn't taking action it isn't moving quickly enough to protect people at least we have this legal system where people can go into court and we can get orders to require clean water we can get orders to require medical studies and testing and get people compensated when there's no other way to do it. Are you allowed to name the judges? Um, I believe I've named, yeah, I've named several of them in the book. There yes, was, uh, yeah, Judge Goodwin. Correct, Judge Goodwin in the, in the original case in federal court in West Virginia for Mr. Tennant. There was Judge Hill yes. who handled our case in um, the class action case. Judge Sargas, who's um, been More overseeing the personal injury cases in Ohio. Um, so, yes. One of the things, talking of names, something really jumped out at me in reading the book was clearly the senior management at du DuPont were driving this. And you do not name any of the, or, uh, it, or it escaped me, that could be, um, you do not name any of the senior management. Is, is that a deliberate thing? Uh, no, in fact, we did try to identify, um, there were several folks involved. I believe I, I've mentioned a couple of them in the book. For example, uh, Chad Holliday, who was the CEO at the time, who we had the sort of unusual um, ability to actually take his deposition at one point mm -hmm. where I was able to show him all of the internal studies that frankly, I think um, had been withheld from him for, for many years. Um, Richard Angiulo, who was the head of the Teflon business. Uh, there, were, there were a number of folks you know, at the corporate level, uh, not only the business people, um, but you had scientists within the company who are also you know trying to get the business to do the right thing yes uh, you had lawyers within the company trying yes. to, to have the, the company do the right thing as well looking forward what is the next stage of this campaign well um right now i am trying to um, pursue this case um seeking a nationwide class action to try to do essentially what was done with PFOA um, in one community, you know, along the Ohio River, where we set up these massive human health studies to confirm independently through independent scientists what 
health effects are caused by PFOA when you drink it in the water. We're trying to kind of take that model and expand it to a national basis where we do national, nationwide uh, human health studies and testing to show what this broader group of chemicals, not just PFOA, but all of these related chemicals, things like PFOS, which has been used in firefighting foam that's now um, being identified as a source of contamination in drinking water all over the planet. Um, but what we're hearing, unfortunately, you know, as we find this contamination from PFOA, PFOS, some of the replacement chemicals like Gen X, um, that we're hearing from the companies, well, there's insufficient data to show what these do to people. <laughs> yeah, almost the same thing we heard 20 years ago when we first started um, digging into PFOA. So what I'm trying to do is, is take this, the model that, that we were able to use for PFOA and able to use to confirm those health effects, expand it on a national basis, and, and look at this broader group of chemicals and confirm once and for all what these chemicals can actually do to everybody and have it confirmed by independent scientists that people can't keep disputing and fighting over. Because my goal is, frankly, to, to try to find a way to, to end all of this litigation. Yeah, I'm a lawyer, but I'll be the first one to tell you, people shouldn't have to go into court, shouldn't have to be fighting legal battles for 20 years to get clean water to make sure their blood isn't poisoned, to make sure their babies aren't being born pre-polluted with chemicals, and then be told, we have no idea what will happen to your baby uh, 10 years from now. Um, people shouldn't have to go into court to do that. But um, unfortunately, at this point, um, you know, that, that's really the only option we we're, we're seeing in the United States as the regulatory process, the legislative process, the political process keeps getting dragged on and on and on. Public engagement um, in your crusade against DuPont and Teflon has been extremely important. There was the New York Times article in 2016 and uh, by Nathan Neil Rich and the movie Dark Waters, starring Mark Ruffalo, Anne Hathaway, and Tim Robbins, which will also raise awareness amongst the public. Um, for the public who are listening, what would you like them to do? What, obviously, these sorts of things, your book, the movie, the article, increases knowledge, uh, empowers people. What would you actually like them to do? to help your cause? Is there anything that they can do to help you? Absolutely, and in fact, I think you hit on um, something I think is critical, and that is education and awareness. Um, you know, I've been trying now for several decades to do everything I can to get information out to people, to get um, data out there so that people can start to make their own choices. You know, none of us had a choice to be exposed to these chemicals. None of us knew that these exposures were even happening. Um, we weren't told what products these chemicals were even in. We had no idea um, whether we were drinking this stuff or not. And I think in order for people to begin having any kind of power over to, to stop these exposures and to make things be different, they need to know, first of all, these chemical, that these chemicals exist, that where they are, how did this happen? What can we do to stop it? What companies are moving away from these chemicals? You know, what can we do to, to raise awareness of this? And I think it's been critically important um, you know, that, that we, we found these ways to get this information out. I can't thank the folks enough uh, at Participant, Mark Ruffalo, Todd Haynes, the, the folks that put the film together, Dark Waters, you know, that are able to get this story out to a broader audience. The folks who put the documentary together, The Devil We Know, um, which is out there with the real people involved, so you can see the story. And I, the, I put the, the book together for the same purpose, you know, to make information available to people so they can understand how did this happen? Because I think only by knowing the history and knowing how it happened can we, can we make things different, can we take steps uh, to make a change. And I'm hoping. You know, through the book, the documentary, the film, 
if people are able to see those or read those uh, or listen to it, uh, to the audio book, you know, that, that people will understand we can make a difference. You know, one person like Wilbur Tennant or Joe Kiger, you know, standing up, speaking out, saying, this is wrong. This needs to change. Um, we can do it. We, you know, people can actually make this change. We can actually fix these systems. Um, there are programs and um, coalitions being formed, um, particularly with the rollout of the movie, Dark Waters. There's a group, uh, I mean, a, a, a website that's been created called fightforeverchemicals.com, for example where different organizations and community groups are trying to make information available to people to tell them, here are the products where these things have been used in the past. Here are the products that the companies are making that are switching away from these. Here are the laws or regulations that are being proposed that you could help support or things you can do on an individual basis or a community basis to try to, to, try to make change. So hopefully um, all of these efforts inspire people and and really you know make it clear to folks every one of us you know acting even individually or acting in our own community can can make a huge difference you are a person that can function at the most extreme levels in terms of um, pressure you're known as one of the best of the world's best but human connection has been a catalyst for you to move forward with this campaign, this initiative, this crusade. Um, could you talk to us about the emotional trigger points through from your feelings for the community you first started working with, right the way through to how emotional you felt at one of the last major trials? When, when Wilbur Tennant first called me, and referenced the fact he'd gotten my name from my grandmother. That, that really resonated with me. You know, I grew up in a um, relatively small family. It was um, just my mom, my dad, uh, uh, my sister, Beth, who's one year older than me, and me. Um, no, no uncles, aunts, cousins, or anything like that. We had a fairly small family. My dad was in the military. We moved around a lot, but the one real constant in my childhood growing up was going to my mom's hometown in Parkersburg where we spent holidays, family gatherings. So that was a real emotional trigger for me when when Wilbur Tennant mentioned you know that he'd gotten my name from my grandmother and he was from Parkersburg. Um, and I think that was you know critical um, to to really piquing my interest in, in wanting to be able to help um, help this help these folks. You know, and meeting them, meeting that family, seeing what was going on on that property, seeing, you know, the devastation that was happening on his land and to, to what he considered his family members, these animals and, and, his, and his children as well and his wife um, was really impactful for me. Um, and then the connections, you know, with the folks within my firm, um, you know, my, my boss, um, one of my partners who was the head of our group at the time, Tom Turp. And, one of my other colleagues there, Kim Burke, and folks that you know were really critical in supporting me and agreeing to to let let us take these cases and move them forward for many many years through through very severe economic crises. Um, you know, a lot of this was occurring, um, a lot of uncertainty and unknown. While we're waiting for the scientific results, for example, was was happening during a massive economic meltdown. So. It was critical to have that kind of support um, within the firm and with, with those folks. Um, and, you know, meeting these people who are impacted by this contamination, the, the people in that community who came forward with cancer claims, um, you know, or ulcerative colitis or other severe, you know, incapacitating illness and listening to their stories and seeing, you know, what was happening to them uh, individually. And then when we were at trial, as you indicated, you know, when we finally got to trial and were able to, to see those stories resonate within the faces of the jurors um, and to see that story coming out and seeing the emotional, you know, real person impact that these things had. You know, this was no longer, you know, some abstract business decision or legal, 
legal issue or scientific issue. I mean, these were real people with real suffering, um, and the jury saw that. Um, and you know, that was one of the things that really attracted me then with the folks at Participant and Mark Ruffalo in particular, you know, who reached out and was just incredibly passionate about wanting to bring this, this story to a broader audience in a way that really touched people with the real human impact that something like this has. And I, I think they did a tremendous job doing it. And it's something I really wanted to do in the book as well, is not just give the readers an insight into the strategy, the chess game, the legal maneuvering back and forth and the science, but what impact this had on the real people. So you'll see discussion about Mr. Tennant and his family and his children and his wife. Um, you'll see discussion about Sue Bailey and, and, and Karen Robinson, you know, with the, the women who's, who had children during this uh, Teflon uh, problem at, at, the, at the facility. Ken, Ken Walmsley, one of the workers at the plant, and just the tremendous, devastating impact that this had on his life. So I think all of those, um, you know, those human impacts were incredibly important. And, you know, I, 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 I'm a strong believer, you know, you've got to reach people on an emotional level too. And you, you see that in the film, and I talk about it in the book, one instance in particular where we Finally, I finally got the chance to sit down with the CEO of DuPont in a deposition. And my main purpose there was I wanted to reach him as a person to, to show him these studies and to, to show him, look, you know, this is what is really in your files. And just to see, to look at him eye to eye and, and see, you know, um, does he get it? You know, does this look at what look at what's really happening here uh, to people? And I think that that was effective. And I, I think um, we, did, we did reach, uh, we were able to communicate that way. So um, yes, there were a lot of um, pivotal, um, critical human um, stories involved in throughout this. You've clearly met and continue to meet uh, incredible people. Is there one individual that you would like to meet and haven't been able to do so, so far, that could help with moving this to the next level, possibly the global level? You know, um, it's hard to name just one, but I would, I would really like to be able to sit down with um, one of the current CEOs of either DuPont, Comores, or 3M, um, and just, again, you know, try to, to understand how it is that despite all of the science that now exists, all of the studies that have been done, all of the people who've been directly impacted, you know, there can still be public statements being made that there's insufficient science to suggest there's any health threat here and that um, regulations aren't necessary or that uh, we just don't know enough and people should um, continue to use these chemicals. Um, I'd, I'd just really like to have an opportunity to have a discussion about that. And as a final question to all those budding environmental lawyers out there, do you have any advice? Yeah, you know, um, you never know where your career path is going to lead you. Um, and you know, take a risk, go outside your comfort zone. Um, you know, I think that's one of the things that I've learned through this process is, you know, I started off at a law firm and actually I'm still there. That'll be 30 years this year. Um, at a, but the law firm was, was known as being more of what you would call a corporate defense firm, a firm that represented a lot of big companies. And, um, I would never have guessed, you know, that I would end up, um, uh, handling the kind of cases I've handled. Um, and uh, doing the kind of thing that I'm doing. But, you know, there were points in time where, you know, you, take the, you make a decision to take a risk, maybe do something that, that's a little uncomfortable, um, but that's the only way things change is taking a risk, sticking, stepping outside your comfort zone and seeing what happens. Robert Billot, the man who became DuPont's worst nightmare, to quote the New York Times, thank you very much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. 
Thank you so much. It was a real um, pleasure to talk with you as well.